The last time we were together, we looked at the book of Hebrews and we studied from chapter 5. And in our study of chapter 5, we looked specifically at the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we started by looking at the basic qualification of priesthood as defined by the book of Hebrews. We said the first requirement for, the, for, 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 priest, for priesthood as defined by the book, book of Hebrews is, by, is what is referred to as divine appointment. In verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible says, Every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God. And that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. In verse number 4, he said, No man take this honor upon himself, but he who is called by God as Aaron was. In other words, anyone who is served as a priest is by is done, that their priesthood is by divine appointments. We said number two, the priesthood is a divine responsibility. The priest has a responsibility to minister to God on behalf of the people. Number three, we said that the requirement for priesthood is that it must have divine compassion. In verse number two, he say he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. In other words, the priest is not indifferent towards, the, what they, towards sin. He is also not too harsh against sin because he knows that he himself is subject to those particular things. And so that is why he has to be compassionate because he's ministering to God on behalf of the people. He's standing in the gap. But we saw also in that study that our Lord Jesus Christ was referred to as a priest. And we said that priesthood in the Jewish community is only reserved for the family or for the tribe of Levi. And we all know that Christ is not from the tribe of Levi. He's of the tribe of Judah. And so we ask the question, how is it possible that somebody who is not a Levite becomes the priest? And we said, number one, Jesus is a priest because number one, he's divinely called also. Verse number five of Hebrews chapter five tells us, so also Jesus did not glorify himself to become a high priest. But it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. We said number two, Jesus is a high priest because he is of a higher order of, high, of, of priesthood. And the Bible tells us in verse number six, as he, is also, as he also said in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Which means the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ is of a higher order than the regular priesthood that we have. That's why Jesus is referred to in scripture as, a, as, as our high priest. Number three, we said Jesus is qualified to be a high priest because he has divine compassion for the people. The Bible said, though he were his son, he had to learn obedience by the things which he suffered. Which means he went through the same thing that you and I are going through. And then finally, we said Jesus qualifies as a, as a high priest because he himself made himself a sacrifice for sin. Verse number 9 of Hebrews chapter 5 tells us, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. In other words, Jesus became the sacrifice that was offered for the sin of humanity. And because of that, he qualified as what? The author and the finisher of our faith. And we closed our session together last time by talking about the importance of the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ as it relates to us believers. We said it is important because it brings us back to life. The priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ brought us who are sinners back to life. Number two, it made us acceptable in the presence of the Almighty God. Number three, we now be became the chosen people of God because of the priesthood of Christ. And then number four, we are called to enjoy fellowship in his presence because of what Christ did for us. And that was what, that's a high level overview of what we talked about the last time we were together. And so this evening we are going to continue from our study of the book of Hebrews. And tonight we are going to be studying from the remaining verses of chapter 5 and the first two verses of chapter 6. And so if you have your Bibles, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And we'll start reading from verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 5. We'll start reading from verse number 11. The Bible says, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to utter, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, the, for, when, uh, for, when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need to 
that won't teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of their senses, who by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And if you go to chapter 6, reading from verse number 1, the Bible tells us, Therefore, living the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God, of doctrine of baptism and of laying of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. May the Lord bless the reading of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. So those are, the, those are the verses that we are going to be focusing on for our study this very evening. One thing I want you to understand before we go in depth into this study is number one, the writer of the book of Hebrews from the verse of the scripture you have read, Hebrews 5 from verse 11. The first thing you see in those passages of scripture is the challenge of slow understanding. The challenge of slow understanding. Here the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us, he said, there's a lot that I want to tell you about the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot that I want to tell you about the nature of that priesthood, the height of that particular priesthood. He said, but I cannot tell you right now. I started a conversation in verse number 10. I'm telling you that Jesus Christ belonged to the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is higher than the Aaronic priesthood. He said, but I cannot begin to tell you that conversation. I cannot begin to go into details of that conversation, of the details of the priesthood of Melchizedek. I can't go into it. He said, the reason is because I have many things to tell you, verse number 11. And there, many of them are very hard to say, to be uttered. Seeing that you adore. In other words, I cannot go into the detail that I want to go into because you don't understand. You are dull of hearing. You are not really interested in, you are not, you have not developed your spiritual muscles to be able to handle the information that I'm about, to, that, that I'll be giving to you if I go into detail. You are not ready to hear the word. You are not ready to heed the word. And as such, you deny yourself of the privilege and the, of exposure to the depth or the deep things of the word of God. So the first thing you see is the challenge of slow understanding. That when an individual does not fully understand what the word of God says, they deny themselves the opportunity of seeing the depth of that word of God. That's the first thing you see. The second thing we see is the effect of immaturity in the life of a believer. The effect of immaturity in the life of a believer. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, For when the time, for, for, for when the time, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which is the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. In other words, the Bible is saying, the goal of every Christian is to mature as a believer, is to grow to maturity. There is nothing as stagnation in the body of Christ. You cannot come into the body of Christ and remain the same. The writer of the book of Hebrews is trying to make us to understand that Christ expects us to grow so that we can grow and develop our faith and become more mature in the things of God. But not only that, so that you too can be able to help other people grow in their walk with the Almighty God. That is the expectation of our Lord Jesus Christ when we walk with Him. But the unfortunate thing is that the believers, many believers at that time, and many believers now, are having a very, who are supposed to be matured, who are supposed to be helping others to walk with the Lord, unfortunately, they are the same people who need to be mentored, who need to be developed. When we are supposed to be teachers and leading others in the way of the Lord, the writer of the book of Hebrew is saying that we ourselves need guidance. When we are supposed to be teachers, we ourselves are students. When we are supposed to be instructing others and in the things of God, we ourselves need instructions in the basics of the scriptures. As such, because we are not growing, because we are not maturing, because we are not where we are supposed to be in the faith, the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, you are finding it very difficult to handle more advanced teachings of the word of God. You are finding it very difficult to understand what God is trying to tell you at a higher level. 
We need milk. Because we need milk, we are not strong enough to be able to receive the deep things of the word of God. As a result of our immaturity, it's causing us to be able to regress backward instead of advancing forward. And that's what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying. He's saying that when you are supposed to be teachers, you yourself need to be taught the first principles of the scripture. And that is not supposed to be. The third thing that I want you to see from the passage of scripture we read. Look at verse number 13 and 14. The Bible there, the, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews now paints a picture. A kind of a contrasting picture between those who are matured and those who are immature. In verse number 13 he says, for everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but strong meat belong to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying that here is a sign for you to recognize the people who are growing in the Lord and the people who are stagnant. The people who are matured and the people who are immature. The people who are advanced and the people who are still at the very basic level. He said there is a picture. There is a contrast between the two of them. And it's trying to make us to understand that you, if you want to know who they are, if you want to understand what they are, you need to look at what they are able to absorb in the word of God. Okay? He's saying, those who are new are still babies, they are unskillful in the word of righteousness. They don't know what it means. They don't understand the meaning of the, the, the requirement of the word of God. They are not able to live by that requirement on a consistent basis. They are not able to apply it on a daily basis. He said, when you see somebody who lives an inconsistent Christian life, that person is still immature. Because they have not been able to take the word of God and apply and live by it. He said, but when you see a mature believer, the Bible says that you know them by the way they handle the word of God. By the way they relate to the word of God. By the way they apply the word of God to every aspect of their life. They are not discriminating as to the application of the word of God in their life. They are not saying because this is inconvenient, I am going to take this away. And because this is convenient, I'm going to live by this. They are applying the word of God to every department of their life. You know them by the way they live. You know them by the ability to be able to discern good and evil by the you from the word of God. That's what he's saying. That if you look at the life of the believer, you can tell what level they're in. And that's why Jesus Christ himself said, by their fruits, you will know them. Well, so if you are matured, you will know. If they are immature, you will know. By the way they handle the word of life. And so if you go to chapter 6, beginning from verse number 1, we see the fourth thing that I want you to look at. And then the writer of the book of Hebrew is now calling believers to maturity. He's saying, enough of your time on that level of immaturity. It is time for you to move on to something better. It is time for you to get up from where you are and begin to advance in the things of God. Here the Bible is calling us that there is a need to grow to maturity. There's a need to develop our stamina. The need to build and to develop our stamina to be full functional, fully functional members of the body of Christ. To be able to support not just ourselves, but others in the work of the Almighty God. And so in verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews chapter 6, you will see the Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God, or of doctrine of baptism, or the, or the laying on of hands, or of the resurrection of the dead, or of eternal life. In other words, he's saying, when you came to Christ, you understood what these basic things are. There is no way you can come into Christ without first of all being rep going through repentance. After you have repented and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, he said that the next thing you're supposed to do is to live a life of faith. Because you have to trust God to be able to walk with him. If you don't trust him, you can't walk with him. That's why the Bible says, can two walk together? I said they have agreed. There has to be a repentance that brings you into the door. And faith that gets you to be able to continue to walk with him. He said there is a pricey, there is a private part of our relationship with God. That is the time where you repent. It's private. When you walk with God, it's private. But at the same time, he went on to talk about the fact that there is also a public aspect of, of our faith. And so if you read verse number two, he said that, you know, if you read from verse number one, he said, therefore, living the principles of the doctrine of, of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work or faith in God. That is the private part. 
He said, of the doctrine of baptism and of the laying of hands. Baptism and the laying of hands is a public display that you are now affiliated with God. So the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, you have, you know, when you came to Christ, you did the private parts. When you identified with Christ in the upper, in the, in the public, in the public by, do, by going through water baptism and doing all that, you showed the world that yes, you are identified with him. He said, now also, you are trusting the Lord for the final resurrection. Okay? For the resurrection of death and eternal joy. You are trusting God for the final promise to be delivered unto you. He said, you understand all those things. You have been taught all those things. You have been made to understand these things and you have lived by them. If you have truly lived by them. He said, now leave all those things aside. These are supposed to be your foundation. Those are supposed to be the basis upon which you build your life. He said, leave those things and begin to move on to perfection. What does that mean? It means take what you have learned and build on it. Take what you have learned and begin to apply it. Take what you have learned and begin to live by them. He said, that is when you begin to move forward. Not repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And so this evening, we are going to be focusing on just one or two verses of scripture. And I want us to go back to verse number 11 of Hebrews chapter 5. There the Bible says, Of whom we have many things to say, and are hard of to be uttered, seeing you are full, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which is, would be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong drink. So what is the Bible telling us here? The Bible is basically telling us, just like I stated earlier, that the, the, you know, there's a lot to be said about the mystery of the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But because the believers that the writer of Hebrew was addressing, because they were immature, because they were not growing, they could not take the depth of the instruction that he wants to give to them. And so why is this particular, why is this important? Why was it important for the, for the, for the writer of Hebrew to point it out? That you are missing out on the mystery of God because you are still immature. You are not getting the information because you can't take it. Why is it important for them to understand this? It is important because, my brothers and sisters, when you do not grow, when you are not matured, when you remain on the same level, you deny yourself of the privilege of exposure to the depth of the word of God. There are so many mysteries that are in the word of God. There are so many wisdom that are embedded in the word of God. A lot of treasures that will aid our lives to live the fullness of life that Christ has in store for us. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. But that abundantly abundant life can only be accessed when you decide that it's time for me to expand and grow in the things of God. So it is important, number one, because immaturity denies us of the privilege of the exposure to the depth of the word of God. Number two, when you refuse to grow, we deny ourselves the exposure to the secrets of the kingdom. The Bible tells us that the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Which means if you don't fear him, if you are not, if you are not deep, if you are not deep in the things of God, the secrets of the things of God will not be made available unto you. Number three, why is it important? It is important because when you refuse to grow, when you refuse to advance your knowledge of the word of God, we deny ourselves of the keys that unlocks the blessings of heaven. Because there are, three, there are blessings that God Almighty has made available and there are keys that unlock that blessing. And unless you are, you are mature enough to be able to know what those keys are, the blessings of heaven will be elusive in the life of so many people. And then finally, it is important because immaturity denies us of the access that God has made available to the treasures, to the throne room. In other words, when you don't know what you're supposed to do, you wander about in dry places. Simply because we have refused, you know, because we, you know, the, the, the effect of this immaturity makes us not to be able to handle the, 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 the word of God that is supposed to be made available to us. Because they are not matured. Because the writer of the, the, the audience of the writer of the book of Hebrew, and by extension, many in the body of Christ today, because we're not mature, we're enough to handle the word of God. Because we're not developed enough to be able to understand it. Because we're not fully grown to understand it, to take advantage of the information that is in the word of God, we we'll find out that we lose out of the blessings that are present in the word of God. I want you to open your Bible to Galatians chapter 4. 
And I want you to see something there. In Galatians chapter 4, if you read from verse number 1, the Bible tells us something very interesting. It said, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child. Huh? Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse number 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs in nothing from a servant. Though he be the Lord of all, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed by the Father. What does that mean? Here the Bible is telling us, as long as we children of God remain to be children, as long as children of God who have access to the throne of heaven, who have access to the treasures of heaven, who have access to the resources of heaven, as long as children of God remain as children, they remain as babies, they remain undeveloped, they remain immature. The Bible is saying that child of God will be treated just like a servant. Look at the word of God. I didn't say it. Okay. Say, so now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs not from a servant. It's not different from a servant. He's limited in his assets. He's limited in what he has control over. He's limited in the control of the resources of his father. Because he continues to remain a child. So as the child of God that, continue, that refused to grow up is not different from a servant. Because as even, even when he's a child of God, as long as that child of God refused to grow up, he will continue to be under the direction of other people. As long as that child refused to mature, that child will continue to remain under supervision. And that is why you don't wake up, you don't wake up one day and give the keys of your car to your 10-year-old child. Why? Because they are not matured enough. Even if you have the, your, that car listed in your will to go to him if you suddenly pass away. Even if you pass away that day, you will find out that that child will not own that car because it's still not what? Matured enough to possess it. As long as a child is, a, as long as a child remains a child, he does not have access to the treasure of heaven. So you see, that the writer of the book of Hebrews is telling us that the body of Christ, yeah, the body of Christ, that you are not going to, you know, you are not doing yourself any favors if you refuse to grow. You are not doing yourself any service if you stay immature. You are not doing yourself any service. You are actually cheating yourself if you refuse to take hold of the word of God and apply it into your life and grow up. He's saying as long as you remain a child in the kingdom of God, you are missing out on a lot of things. Okay? And the question is, why is this important for you? Why is it important for me? Now, brothers and sisters, it's important for me and you because immaturity is dangerous to you, is dangerous to me. The reason is because when you are immature, you have no idea of the devices of the devil. The Bible says, do not be ignorant of the device of the devil. As long as you are immature, you are ignorant of the device of the devil. And that is why you find out that you never allow a child to walk on the street alone. Because they don't know the dangers that are lurking. Number two, why is it important to you? It is important to you because immaturity blinds you from the benefits of the cross. And that is why if you are holding a hundred dollar bill and you are holding a very beautiful candy, okay, and you approach a child, and you present it to both of them. You present both of them to the child. What do you think the child will pick? Of course it's going to pick the candy. Because they do not know the value of the $100 bill. When you remain as a child, when you remain immature, you lose out. You lose out of the benefit. You are blinded by of the, of the, you are blinded, you know, it blinds us from the benefits of the cross. You cannot see what Jesus has done for you when you are immature. Number three, why it is important for you. It is important because when you are immature, you deny yourself the access to your full inheritance. You deny yourself access to the full inheritance. Go back to that Galatians chapter 4 and read it again. He said, now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant. He does not access the full blessing that his father has made available unto you. That is why it is important for us to understand this. Number five, it is important because when you are immature, you are exposed to the deception of the devil. 
He can tell you anything because you don't know. You believe it. You, it's also very important that you, you. It's also very very important that you, you know that that you that you understand this in this question of maturity because immaturity makes us a dependent person. You're waiting for somebody to explain it to you. You're waiting for somebody to take you somewhere. You're waiting for somebody to do something for you because you are not mature enough to do it yourself. And that's why you cannot walk into anywhere and say, I want to get a loan on my own because you are not mature. Nobody will give it to you. You can't jump in the car and drive by yourself because you are not mature enough to get a license. You can't jump in the car and do certain things on your own because you need an adult. You need somebody. You are under supervision. And that is why a believer must not enjoy the state of immaturity. And so you see, for us as believers, it is necessary for us to be able to grow. It is necessary for us to grow in the things of God. It is necessary for us to be able to mature. And the question is, how do you do it? How do you mature in the things of God? Open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And from there we start reading from verse number 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We start reading from verse number 2. The Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. That why? So that you may grow thereby. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So from this verse of the scripture, you see that we grow and we mature in the things of God by building on the foundation of the word of God. A believer that wants to grow, a believer that wants to mature in the things of God must have his foundation in the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, if you don't spend time in the word of God, if you don't ruminate or, you know, or, or bury yourself kind of a, or kind of marinate yourself in the word of God, growth will be elusive in that person's life. So the Bible is saying maturity of a believer. The believer who will mature is a believer that number one desires the word of God. There has to be a hunger for the things of God. Number two, there has to be a feeding on the word of God. Number three, there has to be a studying and a meditation on the word of God. And that's what the Bible tells the book of Joshua chapter 1. It said this book of the law must not depart from your mouth. You must meditate on it day and night. He said that is the only way you can make your way prosperous. So the believer who wants to grow, the believer who wants to mature, the believer who doesn't want to be a prey in the hands of the enemy must first of all desire the word, feed on the word, study the word, meditate on the word, and engage the word. And by engagement, it means you take what the word of God says and you put it into practice. There is one thing for you to study the word of God. It's another thing for you to take what you have studied and apply it in your life. Because it's only when you apply the word of God in your life that is when the blessings come. The word of God that is not applied will not deliver. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Then we began to see the glory of that particular word. Until the word of God become flesh in your life through actual engagement. Through actual practice. The glory of that word will not be made manifest. And that will not be your portion in Jesus name. So it is when the believer does the word, lives by the word, practices the word, engages the word, that is when growth and even maturity begins to show up. But that takes time. It takes discipline. It takes endurance. It takes diligence. It takes consistency. Maturity does not happen overnight. If it happens overnight, it is not maturity. It is fertilizer growth. And that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. So, but the result... Of the, of the maturity that takes time, that takes discipline, that takes sacrifice, that takes patience, that particular maturity produces a, a believer that the Lord Almighty can trust. It produces a believer that the Lord Almighty can reveal the secrets of heaven unto. It produces a believer that will able to walk in the depths of the knowledge of the word of God. And that believer... The Bible says we not be we not live a life that is not fruitful, but their life will be productive and fruitful, and that will be your lot in Jesus. Then the question is: Are you willing to pay the price of maturity? Are you willing to be able to take the time? Are you willing to be able to digest the Word of God, to be able to feed on the Word of God, to be able to ruminate on the Word, and to be able to engage the Word of God on a daily basis? Are you willing to do that? For those of us who are willing, let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.